I'm super excited about this talk from, from John. Uh, everybody loves the Verizon DBIR. And so was it November, I think, John, when you guys rolled out this report last year? And it was the first of this particular type. So very excited to see you Absolutely. run through it. Also, John's an uh, Army guy like me. So shout out to, uh, to all the Army, Army uh, men and women that are on the line with us as well. But John, go ahead and take it away. All right, so let's get started here. So cyber espionage report. So to answer your question, Rick, we, uh, we launched this uh, report in November of last year. So this is, if you want to look at it uh, from the standpoint of a deep dive into the data breach investigations report, which is a report that we do annually and have done so for 13 years. So a little bit about my background real quick to kind of level set here in terms of where I'm coming from. I had 12 years experience with the United States Army as a counterintelligence agent. And then I transitioned 11 years ago into the corporate world working for Verizon. So I was very fortunate to have my skill set doing digital forensics, investigative response, uh, convert into the corporate world. So this particular topic uh, today in terms of espionage, more specifically cyber espionage, is something that's near and dear to me from my government days as well as um, my last 11 years here with uh, Verizon. So. Let's talk about the report real quick in terms of the parameters for the report, and we'll talk about uh, cyber espionage and how we define it. So the cyber espionage report, this is our first ever deep dive into this topic. Uh, it's something from the standpoint, I think a lot of folks on the call today probably realize this is a challenging threat, a challenging type of data breach to prevent, mitigate, detect, and respond. And in particular, from my standpoint, respond and, and do the forensics on, because these folks tend to be um, very hard to uh, detect and very hard to respond by extension. So for cyber espionage, we're looking at one of the nine incident classification patterns in the DBIR. There's actually 10, there's a catch-all, but those patterns go back uh, to 2014. And it just so happens that's where we went back to in terms of looking at the data for inclusion in this cyber espionage report. So we wanted to follow or focus on that incident classification pattern. And we're looking at seven years worth of data from the 2014 to the 2020 DBIR. So that is the actual publication year of the DBIR. So the actual raw data goes back to the previous year. So for example, everything I talk about today is cut off of October 31st of 2019. So we looked at 1,580 cyber espionage breaches. And a few things I want to point out here is we're not going to get into attribution per se uh, for this report. We're also not going to get into the nitty gritty IOCs uh, in terms of uh, what's happening, the very specifics, you know, file names, hashes, etc., IP addresses. But we are going to talk about tactics, techniques, and procedures. And we're also going to talk about the victims, uh, the attributes. We're going to follow the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability the assets that are being targeted or compromised, as well as the data. And I think when you see the data, you, you'll really understand uh, a lot about this particular type of threat actor and what they're looking to do. And most importantly, we're looking to prevent, mitigate, detect, and respond. So I'll point out some of the frameworks that we used as our compass points and decoder rings for the report. Uh, one of them in particular in terms of prevention, mitigation, detection, and response controls is the Center for Internet Security, Critical Security Controls. So let's define what cyber espionage is. So this is, for the DBIR purposes, this is cyber espionage. It has to have an espionage motive when we're looking at cyber espionage breaches. There has to be a confirmed data breach and it has to be an external threat actor, okay? And these external threat actors are gaining access to the data, the assets, the environment via unauthorized means. And they are typically, and not all the time, affiliated with nation state or state affiliated threat actors. And they are looking at sensitive and proprietary information. And generally speaking, and I, I alluded to this earlier, they're looking at uh, specific data. It's generally speaking, it's non-regulated data types. And I'll show you what I mean by that shortly. So these breaches, they're a unique challenge. The threat actors tend to use advanced techniques with a very specific focus. And they're looking to gain access to heavily defended environments. They're moving low and slow, okay, or moving low, lying low, moving slow, however you want to want to categorize it. They can move fast if they need to. And generally speaking, they are looking at that specific targeted access or data, okay, and then they're going to exit without being detected. So they're coming into the environment, avoiding detection, 
moving laterally, avoiding detection, and exiting uh, with whatever data they're looking to abscond uh, and remain undetected. And a lot of times we actually see them remain within the environment for a long dwell time. And we're talking months and years, and I'll talk about timelines here shortly. So let me go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay, frameworks and guides. Just wanna go through this real quick. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. So in laying out the report itself, we use the NIST cybersecurity framework version 1.1 with the five functional areas that you see there. The identify, the protect, detect, respond, and recover. So we do point out controls related to the NIST cybersecurity framework within the report. This forms the actual backbone or at least the structure of the report. We also leverage the Verus framework. So for folks that are not familiar with Verus, it's the vocabulary for event recording and incident sharing. This is what uh, the DBIR is built on. It's how we collect the data. It's the framework we use to categorize the data. It's what we query against in terms of creating the thought leadership publications, such as the Cyber Espionage Report and the Data Breach Investigations Report. If you're interested in more on the Verus framework, you can see the links at the bottom left of the slide there. In today, or for today's session in particular, I'm gonna focus on the A4 threat model. And those elements are the actors, the actions, the assets, and the attributes. I mentioned the critical security controls. These are the 20 critical security controls for the Center for Internet Security. Within the DBIR this year, we mapped uh, the DBIR, or at least Verus, or aspects of Verus to the critical security controls. And we actually pointed out nine of these 20 as being most critical for the DBIR. For the cyber rescue and report, we did the same thing. And throughout today's session, you'll see that I will be uh, at least within the slide showing the critical security controls for each of the elements that I'm gonna show you in terms of uh, Verus and what those controls are and how, you know, how relevant they are to that particular aspect that I'll be covering. But overall, when we looked at these 20 critical security controls within the cyber espionage report, we identified nine most critical, I'm sorry, 12 most critical ones for the cyber espionage report, nine for the DBIR. It's not to say that the other eight aren't uh, critical, they are, but we had to uh, decide which ones were the most critical. And finally, we also use the Viper phases, which is the resonance and preparedness and response phases as part of the frameworks or a solution for uh, better response or better readiness and response abilities for uh, data breaches and in particular cyber espionage breaches. So let's talk about the state of cyber espionage. So I mentioned the nine incident classification patterns. Here they are, there's actually 10. Everything else is a catch-all. And this goes back uh, for that seven year period, back to the 2014 DBIR, looking at 16,090 data breaches. Again, for definition purposes, data breaches are a confirmed compromise of, of data. It's not a cybersecurity incident, although it is. it does kind of fit in, in there as a subset, but these are the hardcore cybersecurity incidents where there's been a confirmed compromise of data. And you can see here within these patterns over time that cyber espionage is actually located at 10% there on the list. It's in close striking distance of point of sale intrusions and insider privilege misuse, which is which are both at 11%. So you may look at this and you may say, well, that's not very high on the chart. Well, you'll see why we think, and, and I'll show you a couple of reasons why this is actually should be higher and this all has to do with reporting and detecting and reporting by extension, okay? So actors, this is the first of four of the A4 threat model uh, uh, components here. So looking at this and just a, a couple other compass uh, direction points here, if you're seeing charts that are dark green, this is cyber espionage breaches for the seven year period, 2014 to 2020 DBIR. If you're seeing bars that are dark blue, this is all breaches for the seven year period from the DBIR, okay? And I'll show you motives here in the next slide or two, but what I wanted to point out for cyber espionage breaches, it is an espionage motive, okay? It goes without saying. For all breaches, depending on the time frame, we're looking at those breaches being dominated by a financial motive. Okay, so for the previous DBIR, for the 2020 DBIR, for example, the top motive was financial and that was at 86% of the breaches. When we look at the seven year period, and I'll show you this shortly here, 
Uh, the breaches are, uh, in terms of financial motive across all breaches, it's at 76%. So you can kind of think of these, these dark blue bars as dominated by a financial motive. So we thought this would be good to compare and contrast. So throughout today's presentation and within the report, we can compare and contrast cyber espionage to all breaches. Okay, so one of the things here that probably sticks out right away in terms of figure 34 is the active varieties within cyber espionage breaches are dominated by either state affiliated or nation state at 93%. And you can see state affiliated is actually at 85%. So you're probably wondering, John, what is state affiliated? Well, if I define nation state as working directly for that nation or country, state affiliated is working indirectly for that state or country or supported somehow or blessed off on somehow. Okay, so we're talking about nation state or state affiliated threat actors. Okay, when we look at all breaches, again, dominated by that financial motive, you see a different dynamic there in terms of those threat actors. You see organized crime at 59%. And that makes sense because a lot of times we see organized crime aligned with the financial motive, business email compromise, ransomware, fraud, etc. And then you see state affiliated at 13%, and then you also see nation state down there at 1%. So there's a big difference here in terms of actor categories when we're looking at cyber espionage breaches versus all breaches. So here's the motives I was talking about. Uh, again, the dark blue uh, bars there in figure 38, that's a seven year time frame. The light blue is the one year time frame. And this is the 76 and the 86% that I was talking about previously. So over time with uh, all breaches, we're looking at 76% for financial, but we're looking at 18% at for an espionage motive. So that is higher than what I showed previously in terms of the cyber espionage breach incident classification pattern. Okay, so pure motives in terms of breaches, it's at 18%. One of the things I wanted to point out too in this slide is if you look at figure, let's see here, I gotta see the, it's kind of hard for me to read the number, figure 36 there on the top, this is actor motives over time, okay? And the top two motives that we've had and have reported in the DBIR for that seven year period, it actually goes past 2014 in time is financial number one and espionage number two. And they're actually, if you kind of look at it, they're a mirror Im image of each other. So this year with financial motive at 86%, uh, espionage is slightly down or at least flatlined. But in years past, you can see that as financial motive goes up, espionage tends to go down in terms of overall motives. So industries, okay? So I don't have a, a slide for this, but I wanted to point out within the cyber espionage report, we do break the data down into regions, not by country, but by regions. And when we're looking at cyber espionage breaches for the seven year period, the number one region in terms of cyber espionage at 42% is the APAC region followed by EMEA, at 34% and then North America at 23%. But when we look at all breaches for those three regions, uh, North America is number one at 65% and then there's APAC at 17% and then EMEA third after that at um, 16%. When we look specifically at industries and in working with the DBIR team, we are looking at different ways to kind of kind of highlight what we're seeing in terms of victims. And one of the ways was to look across the data, seven years or seven years worth of cyber espionage breach data, 1,580 breaches specific to that, and see which industries ranked in terms of percentages when, you know, cyber espionage within that, that, that data set of 1,580 cyber espionage breaches. And number one was uh, public administration at 31%. Okay, so in the DBIR this year, we covered 16 industries. So we then looked at those 16, and then we actually reduced further down to seven. Seven that we had good data on, seven that were at least, uh, were, were above 1%, for example. And those seven, I'll talk about those shortly, but you can actually see them listed in figure 17. So figure 16 is cyber espionage breaches across all industries and the top ones. So when we look at that purely by that, we see 31% for public, manufacturing at 22% and professional 11%. Okay, so professional is, is consulting. When you see information there at 5%, that is uh, media, that's that's telecoms, et cetera. Okay, in case you're, you're wondering, it's not information technology per se. So these are the incident classification or the in industry pattern or industry 
classifications that we use for the DBIR. And you're probably wondering what are those parentheses after each one of those industry types? For example, public is 92. The 92 is the NEICS or NAICS code, which is the North American Industry Classification System, okay? When we look at figure 17, it was a different way of looking at the data. We looked at the top seven industries from figure 16. And then with each in each of those industries, we looked at all data breaches for the seven year period. And then within those data breaches, we looked at the cyber espionage breaches. So you see a little bit of a difference there. So the light blue bars in this particular case is the total number of breaches within that industry for the seven year period. And the dark blue bars is the total number of cyber espionage breaches within that industry. So when we look at it that way, we see that manufacturing is actually at 35%, mining utilities is at 23%, and public is at 23%. And incidentally, you're probably starting to see kind of a pattern here in terms of the industries, right, and cyber espionage. One thing I do want to point out is if your industry is not listed on here, it doesn't mean you, you won't be or cannot be a target of in, uh, cyber espionage or espionage motive. You can, especially if you have sensitive data, keys of the king, the proprietary information. These industries tend to be the ones that are sought after most by the advanced threat actors. They have something that these threat actors are looking for from perhaps a national security standpoint or a competitive advantage standpoint. So public is government, manufacturing, there might be some R&D there, education, there might be some R&D there that's being targeted, for example. So let's look at the data. So this was one of the uh, outputs that we had that really kind of resonated with me. And I've got four charts on here, figure 29, 30, and then on the bottom, figure 27 and 28. So the bottom two figures or the bottom two charts are the one year time frame, the most recent, and the top two are the seven year time frame. And when you look at this, and I'll talk, I'll talk about figure 30 first, 30 space first, that is a seven year period for all breaches. And when you're looking at the top compromised data varieties, you see credentials, okay? But then you see personal payment and medical, and this is your PII, your PCI, and your PHI, okay? This is regulated data types. This makes sense because these tend to be the data types that are targeted by threat actors with a financial motive. They're looking to cash in, sell it on the dark web, for example, commit fraud, for example, okay? When you look at figure 29 for the seven-year period, this is cyber espionage breaches. You see a totally different data set. You see secrets, which is trade secrets at 75%, internal data, credentials, system and classified information at 9%. Totally different data type, and generally speaking, unregulated data. Okay, so think about that for a minute. If it's unregulated data, okay, it's probably harder to define, harder to monitor, OK, you may not be able to define it in terms of your rules, such as rep expressions, looking for track data, looking for um, social security numbers. OK, so there's one thing there uh, to take into consideration. The other is for the regulated data types, there is compliance requirements to monitor for that data leaving the environment. There, generally speaking, isn't compliance requirements for the data in figure 29, at least the, the data that's being targeted by cyber espionage breaches. So it's probably underdetected because it's maybe not being monitored so much because there's not regulatory requirements for it to be reported, breached. And it's probably also underdetected because it's a lot harder to detect because it's a lot less tangible in terms of the PII, PCI, and PHI data, okay? The one thing I also want to point out here is figure 27 for the one year time frame. You can see there there's credentials at 56% versus uh, credentials at 41% for figure 28 for that one year time frame. okay? So credentials are big, they're big over the seven year time frame, but they're big over the one year time frame. So this is not only a data type that can be cached in, but it's also an enabler, it's a tool if you have those credentials. And incidentally, we wouldn't expect to see uh, stolen cyber espionage related data being sold on the dark web. We wouldn't expect that at all. We'd expect that to be a closed loop where the threat actors are keeping that data to themselves for their specific objectives. We may see threat actors purchasing the credentials to gain access into the environment with an espionage motive, but you're generally not gonna expect that they are um, nation state or state affiliated. They're probably gonna be low key about that as well on the dark web. So timelines. So we've got two timelines from the attacker standpoint and two timelines from the defender standpoint. So let me move through these real quick. 
So again, green is the cyber espionage breaches and blue is all breaches. So the two timelines from the attacker standpoint are time to compromise and time to exfiltration. And what you're seeing here is in figure six versus figure seven is cyber espionage breach threat actors move rather rather slow seconds to days compared to all breaches with that financial motive dominating all breaches uh, seconds to minutes. In fact, 70% of the time it's minutes. So it's rather quick for time to compromise for all breach threat actors versus cyber espionage. It goes into the low and slow. And then when you look at time to exfiltration, it's minutes to weeks for cyber espionage breaches versus seconds to days. So those uh, all breach threat actors tend to move faster in terms of uh, the uh, overall exfiltration efforts that they're uh, taking on. Incidentally, the top controls that are on the bottom left, those are the top critical security controls that we, we identified for cyber espionage breaches when it comes to attacker timelines. Now, the second timeline I'm gonna look at is uh, defenders, okay? And this is two timelines from the standpoint of defender activity, time to discovery and time to containment. So figure 10 really stood out at me when we, we did the queries against Varus and, and, and looked at the data. Uh, it made sense. I wasn't surprised, but it was interesting to see it from a data-driven standpoint. When we're looking at time of discovery for cyber espionage breaches, 69% of the time we're talking months or years, and that's plural years, by the way, and that's at 39% for years. Versus figure 11, time of discovery within all breaches, it's days to months, Okay, it peaks at 38% for months, okay, and then it falls off to 12%. So this is the, the, the dwell time that we're seeing within the, the DBIR in terms of uh, cyber espionage breaches. And the time con to containment gets a little bit back to normal in figure 12 and figure 13. It's days to months for cyber espionage breaches, and it's hours to weeks for all breaches. Now, let me move on to one more slide here in terms of discovery. So this is going back to uh, discovering, uh, it kind of aligns with figure 10 from the previous uh, slide and figure 11 as well. So this was also interesting too to me when I saw the data, uh, figure 31 is cyber espionage breach discovery methods and figure 32 is uh, discovery methods for all breaches. So let me talk about figure 32 real quick here. So if you can recall that for all breaches, generally speaking, they are discovered quicker than cyber espionage breaches. But if we look at who's discovering those, we see law enforcement, fraud detection, customers. And, and, and a couple of things come to mind. These are non-technical sources, generally speaking, okay? And there are also, a lot of those can be categorized, in fact, all, depending on how you look at fraud detection, are external to the organization. So somebody's missing the money. When you look at figure 31, different detection or discovery methods. We've got suspicious traffic at 48%, that's half the time. Antivirus, 23%, and then in your computer emergency response team at 7%. So these are technical detection discovery methods, and generally speaking, they're internal to the organization, but they're taking longer to discover versus the all breaches. So just, if you kind of think about it, it makes sense but it's just interesting to see what Veris tells us. One of the things I wanted to point out here for cyber or for the suspicious traffic there at 48%, that's your packets, your derived net flow from your packets. So you have to have the advanced capability to be able to capture those packets and look at that data. Number one, you've got to have those tools in place, right? Your EDR tools, your NDR tools, your UAVAs and all of those. But you also have to have the skill set and understanding to be able to determine if that anomalous traffic is indeed suspicious or if it's an operational issue. So you have to have, you have to define what is suspicious in terms of the traffic and the ports and times of days, but also the data that you're seeing in there and have your folks trained to be able to leverage the tools that you have in place to be able to look at that and do the deeper dive analysis that's required for these threat actors uh, to see that you've, uh, whether you've been breached or not. So the A4 threat model, let's roll through that real quick. Reminder, uh, four A's, actors, actions, attributes, and assets. So we talked about the actors already, so let's go to the assets. Okay, so this slide here is showing you the same thing, seven year time frame for both cyber espionage breaches and all breaches, okay? And we also have inset in there the assets for the one year time frame with the uh, lighter green and the lighter blue. So. 
Couple takeaways here for cyber espionage breaches. Number one, in figure 24, you can see for the seven year time frame that user devices are being targeted. Okay, it's desktops, laptops, and mobile phones at 89%, 80%, and 9%. When we look at all breaches, we see more of a mixture between user devices and servers, where we've got desktop or laptops at 32%, web application servers at 30%, desktops uh, at 24%, and then we get into some PCI devices, such as your point of sale control and your point of sale uh, terminals. Okay, now this is a seven year period. Let's look at, at the most recent time frame in terms of the 2020 DBIR year in figure 22 and figure 23. And the one thing I wanted to point out there is we're not seeing too much of a difference for cyber espionage breaches. They're still targeting the user devices, but you see that mobile phone there is bumped up to 14%. Okay, and that makes sense because in figure 24, we're looking at a seven year period you know, the further back in time, the less likely you're going to be having mobile devices being used in your, your, your work environment or your BYOD environment for your work. But the more recent, uh, you're going to see a lot more usage of that and hence a lot more targeting of that for the cyber espionage threat actors. Now, it'll be interesting to see uh, next year or actually this year for, for the DBI or when it comes out, what we're looking at and the impact of working from anywhere, working from home in COVID-19 and how much more potentially user devices or your laptops and your mobile devices are being targeted by all breach threat actors in general, but also cyber espionage threat actors. The last thing I wanted to point out on this slide was figure 23. And this is the 43% that we point out in the DBIR in terms of web application servers or web app attacks. 43% uh, of the breaches that we saw this year in the DBIR were indeed uh, related to web application attacks. Okay, so that's what you're seeing there for that 43%. Let's move on to the next slide here, actions. So there's much, much, much more detail within the cyber espionage report uh, in terms of actions. I'm gonna go through these real quick today, uh, but I do encourage you to read more about these actions or more specifically the underlying varieties to each of these actions. So here are the seven action types that we have within the DBIR. Left side, cyber espionage, right side is all breaches. You can see for all breaches, those threat actors mix it up. There's uh, six, out of those seven action types that are well represented, at least 6% or more of the time. But when we look at cyber espionage breaches and those threat actors, they're only focusing on three action types, malware, social, and hacking. In fact, all three of those are 80% or higher in terms of their, their, um, their, their actions or, or, or the percentage of actions within breaches. When we look over at figure 40 for all breaches, we see those same three action types, hacking, malware, and social at the top of the stack, but they're not used as much as they are for cyber espionage breaches in figure 39. So social action varieties. So let's, let's look at these three real quick. Uh, the first one is social action varieties. The quick takeaway here is phishing is king in terms of the go-to action variety for threat actors when it comes to social for both cyber espionage at 97% and for all breaches at 87% for the seven year period. Okay, so definitely taking advantage of the human element there. When we look at hacking action varieties, the second of the three that I wanted to focus on today, we can see here that use of backdoor or command and control dominates for cyber espionage breaches, okay, at 86%. It's at 39% for all breaches. And then next in line is use of stolen credentials at 30%. One of the things we pointed out in the DBIR, looking at all breaches, is stolen credentials are a big factor. In, in, in fact, one of the top three attack types for breaches this year. And you can see in figure 46, there they are, use of stolen credentials at 63%. So for the cyber espionage threat actors, it's the use of backdoor C2 and it's the use of the stolen credentials and it falls off from there, but there's also the brute force there. I guess if they don't have the stolen credentials, they can brute force their way in. Malware action varieties, moving on quickly here. So this is, and this list was a lot longer. We had to cut it off somewhere and I think we cut it off at the top 15. So this shows you the top malware action varieties for cyber espionage versus all breaches. So a lot of times we see malware action going hand in hand with hacking. In fact, you can actually have all three uh, attack types that I mentioned, social, then hacking and malware in the same breach. So there's your back door at number one with your command and control at number two, both at uh, 78 and 77% respectively. 
When we look over at 40, uh, figure 48 for all breaches, we see command and control at the top, but then we see things such as export data, spyware keylogger, RAN scraper, which tends to be affiliated with PCI attacks. Uh, a bit of a difference there in terms of action varieties and, and, and the mix up there in terms of what all breaches uh, are using. But for the cyber espionage threat actors, it's definitely the backdoor and the C2 that are number one and number two. Lastly, let's talk about attributes real quick. Uh, so these are the attributes patterned after the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So you're gonna see some overlap here when we talk about the confidentiality. Incidentally, uh, for uh, cyber espionage breaches, confidentiality is impacted 100% of the time. And for all breaches, the same is true 100% of the time because you, you basically have a, a breach of confidentiality. Integrity is impacted 95% of the time for cyber espionage breaches and 58 or 56% of the time for all breaches. And then when we look at the availability across the board, 1% of the time it's impacted by cyber espionage breaches and 7% of the time it's impacted by uh, all breaches. But looking down here, one layer below the CIA triad, those types, and looking at the attribute varieties, you can see what I'm talking about there in terms of integrity and confidentiality, it dominates. Uh, in fact, integrity is number one and number two for cyber espionage breaches, for both cyber espionage breaches and all breaches, and more specifically, software installation and altering behavior. And then after that, you can see the confidentiality is uh, next on the list with secrets, internal uh, credentials, systems, okay, very similar to the compromised data varieties that were shown or looking at previously. Yeah, sorry about that. I lost the internet there. Um, closing thoughts. So uh, please, uh, within, I don't know if we're going to give these handouts, there are links to download uh, some of the references that I was uh, using within the presentation today. So parting thoughts are these are advanced threats. You need to have advanced tools, solutions, and the knowledge to be able to detect these threats. They're doing everything they can to avoid detection, both coming into the environment as they dwell within the environment and as they leave the environment. One of the other things I wanted to point out there was as the internet went down was we do track the malware that they use, but generally speaking, they're looking to also uh, live off the land and blend into the forest. So use tools that are already there, admin tools and the capabilities that they may have uh, with those administrative credentials that they may have uh, taken over. So uh, you definitely need to uh, be looking for those threat actors and using advanced techniques and the knowledge that your team has to be able to um, det detect them, respond to them, and, and deal with them and get back to uh, business as usual. So.